Good afternoon. Welcome back to the BNH virtual event space. You're tuned into Intro to Photography, part three. Today, we're discussing composition. For that, I'd like to thank Sony for hosting this wonderful series. It's a six-part series with Sony Artists and Imagery, Tony Gale. Tony, welcome. Thank you very much. Pleasure to be here. Pleasure to have you back. By now, I think everybody knows what we're doing here. So uh, make sure to get your questions in. And I'm going to turn it over to Tony, and I'll see you guys in a bit for some Q&A. Sounds good. Thank you very much. Hi, everybody. Um, as mentioned, I am Tony Gale. I'm a photographer based here in New York City, and I'm a Sony artist in imagery. Uh, as Derek mentioned, if you have questions, please ask them, especially because, as I mentioned on the last time, it's very easy for me, having done this for a very long time, to skip something that maybe I shouldn't skip or to not cover something as in-depth as maybe I should. Uh, just because I assume people know it or I don't think about it. So if you have a question, ask the question. Uh, you can do it in the chat. You can do it on wherever you're streaming. And uh, hopefully we'll answer it. All right. So this is part three the basic, of the basics of photography composition. Thanks, as always, to the B&H event space and, again, to Sony. In addition to being a Sony artist in imagery, I'm a BenQ ambassador, a Manfrotto ambassador in x ray Colorado. Uh, and upcoming, we have part four, lighting, in a couple of weeks. Then we have part five, post-production. We have part six, finding your specialty. And then uh, we have getting started with your Sony camera on January 30th for anybody who's getting a new Sony camera for the holidays or just in general. Uh, I am primarily a people and portrait photographer. I shoot for a variety of editorial, corporate, and advertising clients in New York. I started out as a cook a long time ago. Do I have it in there twice? I do. Um, in addition to what I am doing, we also have uh, a bunch of other stuff, although I forgot to update this. So only look at the right-hand column. I thought I'd taken this out. Uh, we have the Backyard Birder coming up with Mahesh uh, on the 30th on Thursday. We have Finding Joy, Passion, and Purpose with Chris Orwig on December 7th. And Everyday uh, Macro again with Mahesh on December 14th. So if you like Sony, but you're tired of me, take a look at those. Uh, also, as those of you who've seen me before know, I mention every time, alphauniverse.com has the Alpha Universe forums, which is a good place to ask questions, uh, share your work, just be friendly in the community. People are nice. Uh, I haven't yet to see a single troll there. Please don't be that one. Um, and people are just it's a friendly place. It's free. Uh, Alpha Universe as well. Great place for all things Sony. Like you can read all about the Alpha 9.3 full frame camera that was announced uh, earlier in November. It looks absolutely incredible. My pre-order is in. There's also the Sony Alpha female Facebook group. It is a very inclusive group. You do not have to identify as female to join. And every week there is a different themed uh, micro grant. So Maybe it's on, let's say, landscape. They have somebody judge it. One person wins $500 that week. Next week, it's a different topic, different judge, still $500 every week. And again, you do not have to identify identify as female to enter or to win. Uh, also, this is an intro series, so may, it may or may not be premature for some of you, but Sony Imaging has an excellent pro support program. It's $100 a year. Uh, it gets you three complimentary clean and checks on cameras or lenses, including shipping. Um, it gets you discounts on repairs, gets you uh, accelerated repair time. If they can't meet that repair time, they'll send you a loaner to use in the meantime. Uh, to qualify, you need to make some amount of money from photography, uh, own two full-frame Sony Alpha cameras, and three GM, G, or Sony Zeiss lenses. Uh, it's all available on Alpha Universe. You can take a look or just look for Sony Imaging Pro Support. It's a really great program. Also, it's the holidays are coming up. Everybody's wondering about sales. Of course, there are sales. If you go to B&H, you can see what some of them are. The one that I think is the coolest is the Sony Alpha 7 R5, which is a camera I absolutely love. Mine is actually right here. There it is, 61 megapixels. Super great autofocus, great camera, $400 off. 
bunch of lenses, a bunch of stuff is is on sale. And if you're thinking, what is on sale and how do I find it? If you go and start doing your searches and where it typically says savings and stock, you can go to that drop down and click on deals and rebates. And then it will show you whatever has either a rebate or is on sale so that it's a quick way to just see what there is if you're not looking for something specific. All right. So composition. That's what we're covering today. Why and how to frame a photo. One thing in particular about composition is photography is subjective and composition is especially subjective. Uh, it's something that I find people arguing about a lot online. Um, people will criticize someone for not using the rule of thirds or using the rule of thirds or, you know, any number of things, leading lines, not using leading lines, all of that. It's subjective. So everything I'm going to talk about is something to bear in mind as much as you want to, uh, but nothing is an absolute rule. And I'll bring that up again. If the picture looks good to you, the picture looks good to you. I do firmly believe that every picture ever made could be better. So your best picture could be better. My best picture could be better. Um, whatever picture I take tomorrow could be better. And hopefully we're all trying to improve and the next time it's a little better, the next time it's a little better, but you never get to perfection. You just hopefully get better each time. And to give you an idea of the subjectivity, I have used this example before, and I'm sure I will use it again. This is a picture I took in, I don't know, 1995 in Seattle. Uh, I was doing some black and white night photography uh, near my apartment. I took this picture. I really liked it. I showed it uh, as part of a crit group I was with to a quite well-known fine art photographer who was looking at our work. And he said, I don't know why anyone would take this picture. And to me, it was kind of a gut punch because I really liked it. And he was basically saying it was garbage. Um, and, you know, that didn't feel great. Um, then I showed some of my black and white work at various coffee shops and bars in Seattle. And the person who was curating that picked that picture to do a press release because she really liked the picture that the fine art photographer didn't. Uh, the editor or whoever of the Capitol Hill Times, which was a free weekly a local paper liked it enough to print it. So some people are going to hate stuff. Some people are going to love stuff. It There's very little, if anything, that is objectively, this is amazing and everyone will agree, or this is terrible and everyone will agree. Some people will like your work. Some people won't. The people who don't like your work, if if they're consistent in what they have to say, maybe consider it and think, you know what? Everybody says things are too dark think about that. Is it too dark? Maybe it is. Or maybe you like it dark and it's fine. So just bear that in mind. Uh, also on that topic, a year before I moved to New York, I came to show my work to some photo editors. The first photo editor hated everything I showed them. I felt like, why did I even bring my portfolio? The last photo editor I showed loved everything and said it once you move here, let me know. I will absolutely hire you. Of course, they weren't at that magazine anymore when I moved here, but different people like different things. So composition. What we're roughly going to go over is what are you trying to say? Some of the rules of composition. And again, rules are very much in quotes. Uh, thinking about what's in the frame, lens choice, finding an angle, going over the rules again, and some of the tools that are in Sony cameras that can help. So the most important thing with a photo is what are you trying to say? Why are you taking this picture? Are you making this picture for you? Are you making it for someone else? Do you have a client? Is it for your mom? Is it for your cousin? Uh, does it need to be a vertical picture because of how it's going to be used or horizontal? Is it Instagram? Should it be square? They don't all have to be square anymore. Uh, is it a standalone photo or is it part of a group of photos that will be together? All of those things should come into play. You know, if it's a standalone photo, it needs to tell everything you need to tell in one photo. If it's part of a group of photos that tell a story together, then they can add together to create a story. So for example, this is a cover I photographed for Poets and Writers magazine several years ago of Salman Rushdie. Cover for a magazine, vertical. Always has to be vertical. Interior spread for a magazine, horizontal. 
with space in the middle for the for the gutter where the two pages meet. However, the world has changed. So this is a picture I took for a magazine this fall or this spring. Horizontal opener, but the magazine is entirely digital. So they still make it look like a magazine with pages, but there's no longer a gutter. So as, whereas here, if you have something in the gutter where that white line is, it gets lost. Now, uh, Taylor Rooks here is almost exactly in the center of the frame. You would never, ever, ever run this picture like this in a printed magazine, but for an online magazine, it's fine. You know, things change. So even the rules, even the way that we used to do things a few years ago, it's important to remember that sometimes it's not the same anymore. Vertical, is it for you? This one I just did for myself. So I get to pick how I want it. Thinking about what that purpose is matters. If it's for someone else, what they want or need is important. If it's for you, what you want or need is important. So the rules of composition. Are there 21? Are there 10? Are there 9? Are there 12? Are there 5? Are there 6? Oh, there's a 10 again. So maybe 10 is the magic number. Nobody agrees on what they are. There's a handful that, you know, like I said, rule of thirds, leading lines, things like that, that everybody's going to talk about. But there is no agreed upon these are the rules. And if you break the rules, nobody's going to come and give you a fine. There are guidelines to help you. And most of them exist because in most instances, following the rules are, is more likely to give you a successful picture than not, but definitely not all the time. And don't, don't ever feel like I can't take this picture because it will involve breaking the rules of composition. Take the picture you want to take. Um, if you have a time, try it using the rule of thirds or whatever, if it seems like it makes sense. Uh, but certainly don't, obsess about it too much. But what's in the frame is important. So think about what is in the photo, not just what the subject is. And by that, I mean, when we are walking around as human beings, looking at things, we're really, really good at focusing on whatever thing we want to focus on. Like I'm looking at my camera right now, but my laptop, I've got tons of hard drives. There's, I'm in a room, there's all this stuff. I'm focused on the camera. The rest of the stuff I'm not really noticing. If I took a picture of what I see, it would be terrible. It's a terrible picture. There's just junk everywhere. Once we take a photo, all that junk shows up. When we're just looking, it doesn't. So it's easy, especially starting out, but I think for all of us throughout our careers to see something, think it looks cool, take a picture of it and not realize that there's a bunch of extraneous stuff that's a distraction. So as an example, uh, this is a little, I think those are roses, rose bush in front of Prospect Park last week. Uh, there's the rose bush, looks fine. You see the rose bush, you're like, oh, pretty flowers. That first picture in the upper left, though, is a terrible picture. It There's nothing about that that's appealing. It doesn't showcase the flowers. It doesn't showcase the park. It's not clear what the subject is. You look you know, if I looked at that, I think someone was taking pictures of the flowers. Uh, so then I came in. I tried different angles, moved around, got much, much closer. You can see some of them. There's some roses that are cropped and on the edges. Then I move the camera to include them up, down, left, right. Try different things and see what works. The one thing that everything here has in common that the top, upper left one doesn't is it's all clear that this is a picture of the roses. Which one you like better doesn't really, you know, it's the one you like better. This is the one I like the best. Reasonable minds can disagree. Um, so much like that, try a lot of things. Think about what your subject is and try a lot of things. So here, this is uh, outtakes from the shoot that BNH used to talk about the today's topic um, with this young actress in Manhattan. Started upper left, much too busy. Like the dress really helps pop, but I think there's just too much going on. And because it's a full length, I can't really limit the depth of field too much because I can't back up far enough to use a really long lens. So then I started trying to get people in. I started adding some motion. 
then it's just trying a bunch of things and timing it and finally getting the one that I liked. Try a lot of things. So you'll often find people that insist that you compose in camera, that the best thing to do is compose in camera and don't ever crop. Find your, find your shot, think about what the edges of your frame are in the camera, make sure what you don't want is out, what you do want is in, compose in camera. These are all in camera or crop later. Uh, I feel quite strongly that there's absolutely nothing wrong with cropping later. There are people who will feel strongly the other way, but I think probably more people will agree cropping is fine. You know, this picture I took at the very first Sony condo trip, eh, it's, eh, that's much better. The original cropped. The crop is way better. You also run a risk if you are trying to do cropping in camera of doing something that is called over lensing, which is you're too tight and then something happens and part of your subject is out of the frame. This photo here from uh, a story I shot for, shot for Soccer Magazine several years ago, um, it hit the player's arm and hand being cropped ruins the picture for me. If I'd shot just a little wider, it would have been better. I really believe in shooting a little wide and cropping later if there's any risk at all. Same thing here. His foot's cropped off. This one's fine. Here we are. I like this picture a lot, but there's a lot of headroom. Just cropping a little makes it much better. The original vertical shot, I like it, but I like the horizontal much better. Cropping can be great. Sometimes you don't need to, but certainly don't hesitate to give it a shot. And sometimes, sometimes it's easy to forget that cropping is a thing. Try it. Another common uh, element of composition that people like to talk about is balance, symmetry, reflection, repetition. A little reflection is very, very cool. Um, as I mentioned, we're going to talk about the rule of thirds. With reflection, it's one of those times in particular where often the rule of thirds goes out the window because your horizon is often right down the middle when there's a lot of reflection because you want to see both sides of the reflection. Some symmetry, some repetition, some reflection. And when you're playing around with reflection, try a lot of different things too. This was for an article talking about this woman who's a comedian out of Florida. The studio I was in had this little movable mirror that I started playing with because after I get the safe shots, I try and come up with something interesting. Uh, and, you know, look, the one on the left, the light's not great. I don't love it. The one on the upper right, I kind of like. Lower right, eh. But this one I really, really liked. And I got this one by trying a bunch of different things. Always, always, always try more than one thing. It's, there's always a better angle. There's always a, something better you can do. You know, think about the edges of your frame. So he's way off to the left, but there's space there between his head and the, and the edge of the frame. Here, and he's looking directly at the camera. Here, he's on the other side. He's looking off camera, and it creates a little bit of a tension that is not always the best. Sometimes it is. Um, but typically, if someone's looking off camera, you want them looking into frame, not out of frame. So if this same thing, I should actually just do a version of this where you see it. If he's on the left side of the frame looking into frame, it brings your eye into the picture rather than out of it. Like this. She's looking the same direction, right? But here she's looking into the frame, so we have the whole image in front of us instead of being led immediately out. Here he's on the edge of the frame, but instead he's looking at us instead of out. So we've got that negative space and it balances a little better. This is a picture I didn't clean the dust up off from uh, Yellowstone. Tight wider so tighter you can see the sun that blast of sun on the right because it's so bright it's fading off the edge of the frame 
if you shoot a little wider so that it's all the way enclosed and you're thinking about those edges, it can really make a difference. This, I think it's distracting because the sun just fades into the white at the edge of the frame. Here it's completely enclosed. So again, thinking about the edges of the frame. All right, fill the frame or add negative space. Some people will tell you, always fill the frame. Uh, I do think often people don't fill the frame enough, but not always. So this is San Marino, uh, a little principality encircled by Italy. Frame filled with the mountain and the castle and the tower. Same tower, different time of day. Lots of negative space. Which one you like better? It's up to you. I actually like this one better, though. Lots of negative space on the left. This frame isn't filled with my subject. I think it's clear that my subject is the woman there. But you're getting a sense of the city. You're getting a sense of all this other stuff that adds to the picture, in my opinion. It's clear that he's the subject, in part because his blue shirt really pops out. But there's lots of space around him. Filling the frame. Still clear he's the subject. Uh, one thing in terms of composition that I think is sometimes overlooked, you know, we talk about fast lenses, which are lenses with a wide maximum aperture, which allows for a shallow depth of field. So F2.8 with this 2470 GM2 on the left uh, at 70 millimeters, F22 in the middle, F11 on the right. You can use composition. I'm sorry. You can use focus as a compositional tool as well by Using a shallow depth of field, I'm focusing on just the one pointy, whatever those are called, stanchion or something, uh, on the fence. It really draws attention to it. If you go to F22 in the middle, it's a little busy. Like the car in that's covered by that tarp in the background and the trash can are a little too obvious. It's a little distracting in the buildings in the back. F11 on the right is a little bit in between. I still think I prefer the F2.8, um, but the F11 is not bad. The F22, I think, way too much depth of field. Trying different depths of field can be very helpful. It's not that the answer is always a shallow depth of field either, because there are times when having more information is better. Similar thing here, F2.8 on the left, 7.1 in the middle, 22 on the right. Even here, I think, I think the 2.8 is a little too shallow. I think 7.1 is good. I think 22 is too much depth of field. Again, it just feels busy to me. Think about framing with foreground or background elements. So I like to put plants in front of people a lot. Prospect Park. Uh, this is just my fingers in front of the lens like this. If you're going to do that, you need a really shallow depth of field. Uh, but it can be a fun thing and it, because in a, with a shallow depth of field, you get that soft uh, gradation from dark to, to in focus. It's not a hard edge. Um, I think it can be a cool effect. It works better if you take your lens shade off. Using the subject's hands, my friend Nathan. Another little plant. But putting something in the foreground doesn't always work. So this was a shoot I tried uh, in L.A., in, a year ago, a year and a half ago. Um, and as, as, I as I was moving around, trying different things, because like I said, try different things. Uh, there was this lamp there that I tried to put, I think it was a lamp, that I tried to put in front of her to add some elements of interest and just something. And I don't like it at all. I don't think it worked even a little bit. I think it's worse than the other stuff. So sometimes you try things and it doesn't work, and that's okay. If everything you try works, you're not trying hard enough. You need to experiment more and take more risks. Think about your lens choice. So this is in Arches National Park. We have the 100 to 400 GM at 400 millimeters. We have the 100 to 400 GM at 100 millimeters. Is the tight one better? Is the white one better? wide one better? Depends on what you like. This is more about the rock. This is more about the landscape. You can see I tried a bunch of different things. Depending on the day, I usually like this one better, but sometimes I like this one better. There's also times like here, this is in uh, 
Glacier National Park. I saw the waterfall with the road. The road's a little hard to see there in the middle with the mountains and everything. And I thought, this is a wide shot. And then I took the picture and thought, this is not a wide shot. This is, you know, if the light had been different, maybe. Uh, but I don't feel like this shot really does anything. So I put the 100 to 400 on and did a tight shot. And this shot I like. Eh, I like this one. So it's on the left, it's the Sony 24105 F4, which is a lens I really like. Great walking around lens. On the right, it's the 200 to 600 to 280 millimeters. Think about your lens choice. And sometimes whatever you think is the right answer at the beginning is not the right answer. Similar thing here, the barn in uh, Grand Teton. 34 millimeters on the left, 77 on the in the middle, 105 millimeters on the right, all with the 24105 f4G. Now I've obviously moved where I'm standing with those. It's not just as simple as zooming in and out. You also have to think about where you're standing or where you're shooting from, uh, because your field of view and everything else changes more than more than you think. So, you know, of these, I think I like the middle one better. Um, so you want to think about finding your angle. I jumped around by, think about your camera height. So one thing that I think almost everybody does, I certainly do it more often than I should, especially because I talk about it and know better, is we photograph from however high we are. So I'm five foot nine. So my camera is typically... What is that? Probably four inches. My camera is probably around five, 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 six off the ground most of the time when I take a picture. And that's just what it is. Now, sometimes that's fine, but it can be easy to forget that being higher or lower might be a better image. It'll certainly create a different perspective than what you're used to. And with the flippy screens we have on cameras now, Sony mirrorless cameras, I can go down, I can go up. It makes it really easy to get low or get high in a way that wasn't possible before. You know, with film cameras and early digital cameras, if you wanted to get low, you had to lay down on the ground. If you wanted to get high, you were either shooting blind because you couldn't see or you needed a ladder. Now we can just tilt the screen and go down or up. It's fantastic. So 7th Avenue here, eye level on the left. Very low on the right, holding it above my head. On I'm sorry, very low on the middle, holding it above my head on the right. I like the middle one, I think, but I do like the depth you get in the high one. The one on the left, which is eye level, I think is the least interesting. So, and then think about your height as well. So this is in Yellowstone again, eye level, just getting low and pointing down. Pointing up, getting low below the ferns above in, uh, I think this was Sequoia National Park. Um, and so allowing the yellowed ferns to help frame the image by getting low. Try multiple angles and positions. Try different things. This is a Sequoia National Park. Some of the great sequoias, some stars. It's lit by a bathroom that's about 200 feet away just angling the camera a little, I feel like this is a much more dynamic image by just twisting the camera a little bit. Try different things. Iceland, this old abandoned house. I walked around the entire thing. I kept taking pictures. This is the one I liked the best. And some of that too, you can see on the upper right here, the old gravel road, you can see where other people have pulled off. The road doesn't add anything. I think the grass makes it the most interesting. But it's near the water and you want to see the water. So here you can see the water in the background. You can see the grass. You can't see the driveway. I think it's the most interesting, at least of the shots I did. I am very sure that many, 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 many people have photographed this, not just because of the tire tracks, but because everybody goes to Iceland these days. And uh, it looks cool. Here's an example of just trying different things. I did this a couple of weeks ago at the subway station near my apartment. So Parkside Avenue Q station, upper left, 24 millimeters, straight on, 
Yeah. There's some plants there. I thought maybe I'll put some plants in the foreground. No, that didn't work. I got low. Now you've just got keystoning, which is where uh, when you're looking up at things, they taper. Not interesting. I tried vertical. Not interesting. Move to the side a little bit. Starting to get better. Move to the side, side even more so you see the other doors. Easily the best picture of these six. Now, is it the best picture I've ever made in my life? Not even close. Um, will I ever look at this picture again? Probably not. But for the purposes of this, of these six pictures, I think that's clearly the best one. So just try different things. Try different angles. That's the one I like the best. So again, the rules of composition, Redux, they really aren't rules. They're guidelines that kind of work most of the time, but not always. Everybody uses the same rules all the time. And because everybody uses the same rules all the time, if you adhere to them too closely, your pictures might look like everybody else's. Now, it doesn't mean that you should just throw them out entirely uh, and say, well, I'm going to get great pictures if I don't use them. Being aware of them is helpful. And then being aware of when to not follow them is also helpful. So they're, they're guidelines. They're things to have in the back of your head. There's the rule of thirds. The rule of thirds, one of the most common ones, people have been talking about it probably for centuries, is you think of your frame as being divided into nine boxes. There's a line a third of the way from the left, a line a third of the way from the right, a third of the way from the top, a third of the way from the bottom. And you want your subject or your interest to be either on a line or at an intersection, but not in between. So this, not following the rule of thirds, horizons in the middle. This, horizons more or less by that bottom line. It's a more interesting picture, right? Less interesting, more interesting. Now that said, this would be more interesting still if the sky had something going on besides just being blue, if there were some clouds. Um, if you're going to cut out something, cut out the stuff that's not interesting. But here we are again, left following the rule of thir thirds, more or less, right, not following the rule of thirds. I like the one on the left. Here we are. Uh, one thing I was thinking about as I was actually redoing this presentation is part of what makes the rule of thirds so squishy is we get to decide what element is the thing that we're counting. So her face is centered on that right line. The center of her face is more or less at the intersection, but is that the right thing? Would, you know, should her eyes be at the intersection? Should it be her nose? Should it be her mouth? Kind of depends, depends on what you think. But the center of her face, rule of thirds, I do quite like uh, horizontal pictures like this that are offset. Um, but, you know, you do you. Stars above Grand Canyon National Park. As I shot it, a little bit more rule of thirds-ish, losing some of the the bottom bit that's just dark. Like in this picture, the interest is the stars, maybe the trees on the right, not the just blackness on the bottom. I mean, there's a little detail there, but not enough. So just cropping it a little bit, now it's more interesting and a little bit closer to the rule of thirds. But there are things like this where I quite like this picture, even though I've cropped her feet. Her, fa her face is almost in the center of the frame, a little above, but it's certainly not rule of thirds. The balance and the symmetry is what I wanted with this picture, and I like it. So it's not always rule of thirds. We have leading lines, which are elements, lines in the frame that help lead you to whatever you're either into your frame or towards your subject. So we have these lines leading towards the runner here. We have these lines leading to this woman in Death Valley. We have the lines leading to this gentleman in Times Square. We have this boardwalk just leading us into the image, into the frame. We have the lines of the of the trees leading down to our subject, leading up to our subject. We have her framed with the sky a little bit. 
So that's leading lines. Leading lines are things that will help direct attention to our subject or to into the frame itself. We have negative space and framing. So negative space is the stuff in your picture that is not your subject and not distracting. So this is the original picture. The beauty of a black background is I can just add black for the purposes of this example. The original picture, now we've got lots of negative space. Is it better or worse? Lots of negative space on the top. Is this better or worse? It's not better. But if this were for a client that needed space for a lot of copy, it would be better because they could put lots of stuff there. Coming in a little closer. Now just space on the right. Now just space on the left. Coming in tighter, space on the right. Really tight. Really tight. Even tighter. You know, of those, that's 10 versions. You know, one of those you like better than the others. Maybe it's the one I like better. Maybe it's not. The one I like better is the horizontal one, uh, middle row, second from the left. That's the one I like the best. Uh, but whichever one you like the best is fine. And when I say I like the best, it doesn't mean that you have to love the picture. I'm not saying you love the picture. Maybe you do. But probably you don't. There's also framing by using frames within the image itself. We talked about using foreground elements or background elements to frame. You can also frame like this. This is looking through the window, literally the window frame at my subject. Using the trees to frame my subject. There's a light uh, on the left behind a tree and then another light on behind another tree. Trees are great for hiding lights behind. Uh, there's the classic, just using a window to frame something. This is in Italy. Shop framed through uh, the old Roman baths, framed through the window. A similar shot, not framed by the window. I think this one's more interesting. I think the one on the left, more interesting with the seeing the edges. Uh, Staten Island Ferry framing. However, I think this one has some distracting elements. So coming in a little tighter, I think that's better. This, too tight. Now, there isn't enough of a frame. I think it's a little distracting that we're so tight. I think the middle one is the best answer right here. Boy, I'm going fast. Um, we also have camera tools. So in your camera... If you have a Sony camera, you have various things that can help you. So one of the things that we often, that I often am not careful enough about, especially when shooting landscapes, is keeping my horizon level. Having a horizon that's just a little bit off level really, really feels sloppy to me. If it's way off level, it feels intentional. Now, whether or not you should do that is a different conversation, and it really depends on the picture. Uh, but your camera on a Sony Alpha camera has a level built in. So on the command dial on the back where it says DISP, if you click up on that, you'll get the level. So here we are, level. It can also be helpful in situations like this where the, the yard I was photographing isn't level. So if I anchor off the line that is the yard, the trees aren't going to be correct. They're going to be angled and it may not be obvious. So by using the level in camera, you can be uh, technically correct with your with your horizon lines and your level. Uh, we also have the advantage of grid lines. So here I have the old menu system, the older menu system on the left, the newer menu system on the right. Now, different cameras, it may vary a little bit because the menu system, they keep improving it. But you're looking for camera two, display auto review page, you know, you're looking for grid lines. If it's the older menu, you're looking for shooting display. Uh, if it's the newer menu. And then you've got lines that you can look at through your viewfinder or on your screen for rule of thirds grids, a uh, square grid, the diagonal and square grid. Uh, and you can turn them on or off. So this is the square grid. Sorry, this is the rule of thirds grid, not the square grid. This is the square grid. You would think you would know because it's square. Uh, oh, 
Elizabeth, I just see you, your question came in. I'll come back to you in just a second. Um, the square grid, and then you have the square grid with uh, the, uh, the angled lines. So those can be helpful if you're just trying to line things up or if you're trying to understand the rule of thirds. Uh, but unlike usually when I'm struggling to go in, I went too fast and now we're almost done. So uh, let's see what questions we have. And Elizabeth asked, uh, what do you think the picture of the girl on the ferry that you like is better than the other two? Why, why do I like the one that I like? So let me go back to that. We'll give Derek a chance to see if there's any other questions. So this is the original picture. The reason I don't love this one is I think the exit sign on the right is a little distracting. And this poster here on the left, I think is a little distracting. I think they're a little too bright and draw a little bit of attention. I don't think it's terribly distracting. I don't think it's a really makes the picture bad, but I think it could be better. So here I've cropped those two things out. Uh, which is the one I like the best. So the two elements that I thought were distracting are gone, uh, but you still see most of the frame of, uh, of the inside of the ferry. So you understand that you're inside and she's outside. Here, by coming in tighter, we've lost some of that context for the inside of the ferry. And now it's, are we both outside? And it's just a doorway that's there for some reason. It just loses some of the, of the location information. So back to the one I like, you still understand that you're inside, you still get a sense of the place, um, and she's still framed in the image. So Elizabeth, I hope that was a helpful answer. Um, but of course, reasonable minds can disagree. And I'll tell you for a long time, I stuck with this version, which is the version that I shot it originally before I thought about it more and went to this version. All right. Let's see if there are any other questions. Whoops. That's not what I meant to do. We'll open it up. Tony, I, I have a question or rather a point of discussion. Okay. Is it, how come this one time I'm not struggling to fit everything in? No, it's right. definitely not that. Although okay. I am, I'm impressed. Well, you, you were burning today. Well, I was, I'm trying, I'm trying not to make them go long. And then I went too fat. It's a fine line. It is. It is. It's a fine line, but I need like a metronome here. <laughs> we'll work on that for next time. So my, my point of discussion, it's not really a question is the one headshot you had where it was rule of thirds and you had it like cropped. It was a horizontal, yep. uh, horizontal composition. Yep. Is there any rule of thumb you use on there? I mean, I know with composition, there's a lot of there a lot of these rules we speak of. It's it's personal preference at best. I always it's in, in those shots in particular. If I were to crop something like that, I'd look at it and be like, no, something seems off. But then when you post it, when another photographer posts it, I look at it and I'm like, yeah. And every single time I try to do it myself, I just find I'm like, where do I cut it? Do I cut it? forehead do i show a little bit of the hair do i is there any rules of thumb out there that people should be aware of or anything that you use in your personal guidance i mostly do it by instinct um there is some things like if you're doing a headshot for someone you have to see their hair mm -hmm. because whoever might be hiring that person needs to know they have hair if they're an actor for example um I've never heard a rule of thumb for it that I think is useful. Uh, but I do relate to seeing other people do things and then trying it and feeling like, uh, you know, I'm not getting it. It's not working for me. And then you see someone else do it and you're like, how come it looks so cool when they do it? Yeah. you. I, I'll try the same exact crop and I'll be like, no, something seems off. Or, you know, I've, I've even had people when people do the really tight face crop, when they bring yeah. it in like this and then I'm like, but now I'm cutting off the chin and that, but then I'll see someone else and it's like, what am I missing? I honestly think in those instances uh, that it's because we know what the original picture looked like. Mm, that's a great point. I never thought about that. It's, it's almost like when you, when you edit a picture and there's that fine line between going too far with editing and having that right touch. And then you try to look at it. I'll try to pocket it for two, three days and come back to it and be like, okay, 
does it look edited? But I always, I know what the real version is in my mind. So I'm yeah. always going to say it looks a little over-processed and then I'll err on the side of less editing. I think it's kind of in that same vein. Yeah, I mean, I'll typically with edit as little as possible. But if I'm doing something, like I did a big composite of 24 women that was a this huge, they ended up printing it eight feet high by like 25 feet wide this event um i worked a lot on that and i constantly went to people i know and trust and said how does this look does this does this look wrong uh or sometimes if i'm feeling really sneaky i'll say what do you think and i won't tell them anything you don't tell them it's a composite right because mm. if you know it, it's one thing if you know it's a composite, you can look and you're like, ah, I think that's, that's yeah. the you're, thing. That's when you start looking. It's it's like if you're looking for something, you're going to find it. Yeah. I mean, there's always something. Yeah. But I've seen things that weren't composited where I'm like, is that a composite? And then it's just some weird quirk of the picture itself. Yeah. I think composition is one of those things that I think a lot of people underestimate how important it, it truly is and what kind of role it can play. I mean, I, there's images where... I didn't see anything until I crop it down. And there's images where I'm like, I can't quite figure out what I don't like, but I know it's the composition and I, but I just don't know what about the composition it is, but I just know something's unsettling about it. In, the, in those times I will, I'll either just give up on it or <laughs> uh, I'll do like I did with the gentleman on the black background and just try a bunch of crazy crops. And every once in a while, like the the photo of Melissa Joan Hart that was a vertical that then I did the horizontal. Uh, every once in a while, I'll do a crop and I'm like, oh, this is so much better. Like I really like that horizontal crop of her. Like the vertical is I, I'm fine with. I think it's a good picture. She was great to photograph, very nice. Um, but the horizontal crop I really like. Yeah, but it's, I didn't uh, do it in camera. You know, I didn't think of it. Interesting. Composition. I mean, it's one of those things where it's 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 hard to really give anybody too much direction on it. You can kind of just throw stuff out into the ether. And I think that most of it is like, just like you said, it's kind of whatever your taste is, whatever you're going. It's it's more of a, of a feel than a this is right, this is wrong. And I think trying multiple things. I think that's the biggest rule with composition is as long as you have the time photograph it five or six different ways and see what works because whatever your first thing is probably isn't the best one yeah with me it's usually the third or the fourth I, I get to my third or fourth option and it's always nice to have the ability to not have to throw away pixels or you know not i a lot of the images that i shoot are 24 megapixels so it's one thing if i'm shooting you know with a full frame or medium format and you have that extra latitude but my alpha 7 r5 61 megapixels i've got lots of pixels to throw away plenty of latitude there how, how much do you do you find yourself cropping a lot or for for most of your images you're getting at what you want in camera uh mostly in camera but i think i should probably crop more than i do i think i too often think that what i got in camera is the right answer and it isn't always Okay, I'm gonna I'm gonna throw out a bonus question here that kind of loosely relates to composition. We're talking about looking at images and taking space away from our images. How often do you go back to older images and either re-edit or reimagine them? Not that often. Um, I, I'll very rarely reprocess older images. Although raw converters have gotten so much better, I really should. Mm -hmm. It's just there's so many pictures. Like you, my, well, my catalog has busy. like 70,000 pictures oh, in it man. already. And that's processed files. Uh, you know, it's, so there's, you know. That's me when I'm bored over here and I have nothing new that I've photographed. And I'm just sitting here, I'm like, well, maybe there's something, maybe there's a hit. I, I'm still convinced. I think I'm always convinced that there's a folder that I forgot about that's somewhere hiding on a hard drive that I never looked through the images and I'm going to find it one day. I will say that occasionally I'll go back through a shoot from, eight years ago, 10 years ago, and I'll find a picture that I didn't pick initially and be like, why didn't I pick this? This is the good one. Yeah. Like you just... I, I find my, I find because we're talking about composition and that's one of the first things or, or one of the more prominent things that I find myself coming back to is recropping is going back and 
saying, well, what did I see in this image that made me raise the camera and take the image? Yeah. And I, and sometimes I don't realize it until, you know, cause I shoot with primes. So a lot of times what I saw was maybe a 50 millimeter shot, but all I had was a 24 and I was shooting with a 24 prime. So when I look at the image, I'm seeing it as a 24, but really what I wanted was right there. So, yeah, I mean, because we focus on whatever it is that we see in real life and we're not thinking about the extraneous things that the camera sees. Yeah. Well, there we got a We got a little, it's nice to get a little, a little banter back and forth. Sometimes we don't just get all information. It's, you know, it's good to get inside the mind of the photographer and see the decisions that you're making, why you're making them. And I think that's what the the interesting part about photography is everybody, every photographer has their own way of approaching it. You know, no matter what we're talking about. So Tony, always great having you on, man. So, thank you again for another wonderful part of this great series to all of you out there. If you haven't checked out the first parts of this series, definitely check it out. As we said, we have more to come in this series. And then Tony is going to be diving in in the new year to getting started with your Sony camera. So for anybody who is new to Sony, we got you covered. Don't worry. But a huge thank you to Sony and Tony for this hour of information. That's all we have now for the b virtual event space. Catch you all next time. Thanks, everybody.